to the next session, um, which is our Petra Kutcha Curatorial Slam session. Um, this brief introduction will also cover over into the afternoon so we can give as much time to the presentations and the short Q&A after. The purpose of the Curatorial Slam is really an opportunity for the presenters to bring forth to you and receive feedback from you on projects that they're currently working on. So we will have three in this morning session and four in the afternoon session. They are on a very tight time limit and I'm going to have a timer with a buzzer um, to keep them moving forward and um, then a brief few Q and A's. So, and I'm, they will are also sort of bound to introduce themselves within the time limit as well. So. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here in Detroit and part of this conference. My name is Toby Lawrence, and perfect. So I'm the assistant curator at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, a public art museum located in Victoria on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Sitting at the most southwesterly point in Canada, Vancouver Island is 300 miles in length, and engagement with the land is featured highly in the lives of most Vancouver Islanders. In January 2015, the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria will present an exhibition of contemporary photography. With relevance to our region, the work will call attention to the multifaceted relationships between land, politics, and art histories. Over the past few decades, the discourse of photography has been ever-present in British Columbia. Yet, in the shadow of the Vancouver School, Victoria, the provincial capital, has made little space for photography as artistic practice. Case in point, as my collaborator Michelle Jakes and I delved into the exhibition archive, we found that while photography has made numerous appearances in group exhibitions, the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria has produced only a handful of photo-focused exhibitions in recent years, with greater concentration prior to 1985. So with this exhibition that I'm talking about here, yet to de be definitively named, and with most artists still to be confirmed, we aim to be self-reflexive and to think critically about the breadth of, ga of the gallery's relationship to photographic practice and the potential of photography as a discursive framework. So the initial question went something like this. Given the historic significance of early Victoria-based photographers such as Hannah Maynard and Harold Mortimer Lamb, what is unique about photographic practice in Victoria today? But is this question too regionalist? With no desire to impose undue limitations, we began to consider the links we were seeing in photographers from our region to those we were seeing farther afield. We were quickly seduced by common threads and arguably a common aesthetic, weaving together po poetics and ecology to reflect issues that continue to be prevalent throughout our region, such as land usage, land claims, racialized and marked bodies, social and political identity, and the various interconnections among the former. Thus bore the title of, our, of this presentation. Poetics became the aesthetics form or methodologies, and we adopted ecologies to consider the construction of self, or more precisely, the notion of the self in relation to location and land, both in terms of land as nation state and land as earth. In thinking then about all of these relationships, we began making our list of possible artists. So it goes something like this. My own impetus for proposing the, this project stemmed from the work of Troy Moth, an artist raised in Isuk, a rural mu municipality approximately 45 minutes west of Victoria. With works such as The Moss Merchant, Troy created an imagined narrative emphatic of human interdependency with the land and provides a personal response to potential environmental catastrophes. Further highlighting the construction of identity through the geographic, we turned our attention to Meryl McMaster, a young photographer from Ottawa. In her series, In Between Worlds, sorry, her series, In Between Worlds, explores the mixing and transforming of bicultural identities, Aboriginal and Euro-Canadian. And also while readdressing the symbiosis of land to define the body and the body within the land. Similarly, Dawi Pe Petros reinserts the obscured figure into the landscape, questioning whether geography defines a people or a people define a place. 
He explores landscape as a metaphor for identity and diaspora by bringing together his East African heritage with references to minimalism and land art. For Jamaican artist O'Neill Lawrence, the body is also featured consistently and becomes a repository for questions. The sea functions metaphorically, representing the past and present complexities inherent in racial and gender identity in Jamaica in a manner that is both confrontational and poetic. Another Victoria-based artist that we visited was Mike McLean, a photographer and educator with a profound interest in historical processes and human impact on the land. His current series of salt prints called Debris illuminates the intersections between the landscape and our traces upon it, and links the physical properties of the photographs produced using a saltwater process to the seawaters they represent. Here, Aaron Sheriff offers us an alternate way of thinking about the photographic process. Lake uses an Im image of Lake Okanagan in British Columbia where she grew up and her family still lives. This image taken from an early 1980s tourist magazine was re-photographed many times to create a series of stills. The subtle variations in color and light provide shifting modes of viewing and allude to, the, to early colonial ideals that romanticize and vacate the North American landscape. Jumping ahead to the impact on the same provincial landscape as a haven for re resource extraction, UK-based Hannah Guy animates the notion of ecology with composite photographs of clear cuts in Western Canada. Her critical investigations evoke notions of ecology through ideas of our relationship to the home and habitat, and in turn the fragile balance between our environment and us. And finally, Adele, Adela Goldbard, an, a Mexican artist whose work problematizes our perceptions of reality. With her series Fictions, Adela explores the intersections of the useless and the pragmatic, of use and meaning, fiction and reality, and that which is probable with that which is possible. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Ginger Duggan, and my curatorial collaborator, Judy Fox, is sitting right over there. Say hi, Judy. Uh, let's see. Okay. So we've worked, um, after years as on-staff museum curators, we've worked together independently for the past six years as C2, or Curator Squared. It means we put together uh, exhibitions for museums as their guest curators. And typically, it's our ideas that the museums want us to realize for them. We've worked coast to coast and internationally, uh, developing thematic cross-disciplinary exhibitions that typically pair uh, known artists with newer emerging artists and exploring issues that artists around the world are interested in. That's something that naturally interests us, so it's a kind of an organic process. As you might imagine, and as many of you may have experienced, finding a museum to partner with to bring an exhibition to life from the ground up is really difficult. You have to hit that sweet spot where there's name recognition, so there's, it attracts a large audience, reflects their mission, and when they get the most bang for their buck. Our primary motivation in developing an exhibition comes from the art we see as opposed to those specific uh, parameters, but we do, of course, have to keep those in mind. If we didn't at least adhere to some of them, of course, we'd have little um, success marketing our exhibitions to museums. Most of the time, this is a natural vetting process. Uh, projects that, get, that don't, don't get a lot of traction automatically fall by the wayside and you learn pretty quickly whether something's a yes or a no. Every now and then, though, we come across a proposal that gets lots of interest, but we just can't seem to find anyone to sign on the dotted line. Uh, many museums can work with us for months or even years on the logistics and the details, but then ultimately we're left at the altar. So if you have a strong idea, great list of artists, um, good work, what's the problem? Why can't some proposals make it to become exhibitions? So let's see if we can figure this out, and we'll use our exhibition proposal, Guilty Pleasures, as a case study. Our first discussions about Guilty Pleasures as an exhibition were back in 2009, the very year of the global financial crisis. 
Yet everywhere we went, at home and abroad, there was this undeniable lust for pleasure, despite the hard times. It's difficult to understand why at this particular historic moment across media and disciplines, there's this interest in opulent, excessive imagery, decadence, but it's, it's clear that it's a phenomenon that's still valid. Everywhere we've gone for the last five years since we've been working on the show, we see work that continues to, to validate the idea and, and is relevant. So let's see if we can figure out some of the issues that museums may be having with the proposal, and we'll look at them in terms of the main themes of the exhibition. First, self-indulgence. To give in or to indulge in a guilty pleasure is one of the more obvious ways that we see society reflected in the art that we chose for the exhibition. In this claymation video by Natalie Gerberg, we see a figure dancing atop a table that's littered with cookies and cakes and all the makings of a decadent tea party. But as the video progresses, it takes a dark turn and we see the um, figure literally consumed by consumables. In their own sort of self-indulgence, museums love blockbuster art exhibitions and art stars. So in a thematic exhibition like Guilty Pleasures, having a star-studded checklist should be appealing, should be a draw, but it's so far not proved to be the case. Perhaps museums want either quote-unquote fashion exhibitions with fashion designers only, or art exhibitions with contemporary artists solely. It seems that what we've done with pairing Victor and Rolf and Hussein Chilayan with Will Cotton and Sylvie Fleury for interest just isn't doing the trick. Uh, the second theme, irony, is an effective vehicle to convey messages about the unfavorability of guilty pleasures. Here, a notable Chanel bag is transmuted into a sofa at mega scale. Artist Sylvie Fleury is using giantism and exaggeration to, uh, in her ironic statement about consumerism. Uh, with a show the scope and size of guilty pleasures, think budget, uh, we're suspecting that the smaller university museums we typically work with would not necessarily be the correct fit. We might need larger museums, we suspect. But which one? The ironic thing here is the contemporary curators that we approach with the proposal direct us to uh, fashion and design museums, and fashion and design curators direct us back to art museums. But a uh, 3D wall installation like this one by Beth Cattleman could easily be at home at any contemporary art or design museum, but the trick is finding which one. Um, for us, the, the idea that's the, the solely the most important thing, whether it's conveyed in any number of media or disciplines, for instance, um, anything from a small-scale porcelain figurine to a life-size Lamborghini, and in any media from paper cut wigs to collage, painting, sculpture, wallpaper, the idea is the thing, or should be, rather than departmental territory. Um, and the last, the final theme, judgment, to judge others for giving in, for succumbing to their yearnings. Here, artist duo Ghost of a Dream have um, created a life-size replica of a Lamborghini constructed entirely out of spent lottery tickets, the value of which equals the cost of the car, an outrageous luxury, of course, in and of itself. Um, while we're not necessarily saying that museums are judging the content of the exhibition unfavorable, we are suggesting there are these hurdles, some hurdles that they do seem to think are insurmountable. One of those may be shipping challenges posed by the large, uh, large number of 3D works and installations in the show. Here, major lifestyle and fashion brands are spelled out in cocaine in this installation. So you can imagine registrars all over the country would be <laughs> appalled by the insurance and shipping challenges that that poses. But the fact is we, we work, we're always willing to work with museums on uh, fundraising, getting grants, sponsors, um, you name it. We're, we've had a good track record with that. We just need to get to that point. Perhaps it's installation challenges posed by the variety of media in the exhibition. But there are exhibition designers all over the world who could have a field day with the subject. Um, on the exhibition checklist alone, there's Confetti System, a collaborative who have done installations all over the world that are, would be just right for this sort of thing. So for us, we find challenges exciting, but we realize that museums don't always want something that's going to be that uh, crazy or that much of a you know, hard thing to mount or put on. And we recognize that sometimes they want things that fit literally within the box, but we would like to be able to work with them to show that we've had success with this in the past and it's definitely doable. Ironically, we were just approached by a museum while we were putting this presentation together to present Guilty Pleasures in 2017. And while we remain hopeful that it will happen, we nearly have the offer in the ring. We are prepared to see Guilty Pleasures remain the jilted bride. And um, so I'd like to open it up to everyone for questions.
questions or comments or suggestions for anyone? No. Yeah, wait. Oh, there's one. Can I get that one or no? What was your question? Okay. I guess of the various different, since you have fashion, since you have contemporary, since you have photography, since you have installation, mm -hmm. and depending on the institution that you're looking at, obviously different people are in charge of different things. When you're trying to target the institution, do you kind of come with a way to kind of grab the grouping of the curators as a unit so they kind of see that it's not quite so territorial, but a way to kind of merge um, those different departments together kind of un under a united idea or theme? I guess um, so far the museums who have really taken a, um, a stronger interest in it maybe only have one curator on staff or, or the, in the contemporary department it's not so much that we need to pull together the various curators within that museum but um, yeah I mean we, it's, it's just difficult to get it to that point um, at all. So. Mm -hmm. An institutional discomfort with the possible perception of contemporary art itself as a guilty pleasure and that it would redirect critical and public awareness onto collecting practices, markets for contemporary art, and if that is perhaps also playing into the issue here. It could be. So far, no one's uh, given that, given a reason, that the reason for um, saying no to the proposal, but that's definitely a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing I wonder about exhibitions that are traveling exhibitions is sometimes I see them as a time that an overworked staff can ease up on a lot of work mm -hmm. and that it, a traveling exhibition that they borrow is often something um, that they don't want to do a lot of extra work for. The in-house curators would much prefer to put in all those extra hours of hiring a designer or bringing in huge installation works on a show that they've organized themselves mm -hmm. in-house mm -hmm. and a traveling show might be something that could be packaged easily, travel travels easily, shown quickly, and so perhaps the nature of this being sort of a canned show that seems as much work as an in-house show mm -hmm. could be one of the issues. <laughs> yeah, well, um, actually, we, once we find a museum to work with to originate an exhibition, that's the, that's the hard part. That's where the majority of the work is. After that, we typically, it's rather, not easy, but, um, it's not as difficult to find museums or take on take it on as a traveling exhibition because, like you said, it comes as a unit. The graphics have already been created, the label, everything's done, um, and the shipping. Of course, you're not uh, consolidating it all from a number of sources. It's coming from you know one place to the next, all in one unit. But it's the originator. It's the originating museum that has the hardest time that we have the hardest time finding because, they, like you said, they are the ones that do have to have the majority of the work um, or share the work with us, the workload with us uh, to pull it all together. Oh, wait, do you want one more or do you want to? S <laughs> yes? Okay. Yeah. Stay here. Hi. Um, you know, the work in the show seems really wonderful, and I think a lot of museums are used to working by now with a range of materials and materials from, you know, what had previously been considered discrete areas mm -hmm. of uh, collecting. I'm wondering from the curatorial point of view, you know, what is your conception? You know, how far do you go with discussing this beyond, um, you know, a presentation of these works mm -hmm. and whether that comes into play um, in consideration of the exhibition as a whole? Right, yeah, I mean, once we get, if we get to the point where we're able to come in and meet with the staff and of a museum and 
um, beyond just presenting the work and beyond just the proposal, then it's usually, um, we have a lot better chance of having it happen. We're able to, especially with the university museums, meet with a number of faculty from different departments and show them the, um, the value of bringing in dis different disciplines. But um, yeah, it just needs to get, again, to that point in the discussions with the museum. I think um, initially when they see the proposal, they're kind of scared off by some of it, but we need to take it to the next level and explain. So what about you know doing more of that in the actual written proposal that you send? We, um, we actually find that a lot of people don't even read our proposal. <laughs> um, if we can't get in front of someone to present and talk to them in person, it's really difficult. Well, um, even if someone asks us for a proposal and we send it and then follow up a few days later, oh, I haven't even gotten to it, or oh, it looks great, but in explaining the work, we find that they're hearing it for the first time. So um, yeah, being, being able to meet with someone in person and present to them in person is, makes a world of difference. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Joanne Northrup from the Nevada Museum of Art, and today I'm going to talk with you about Late Harvest. It's the first exhibition to juxtapose two different genres of art that share a focus on animal others, traditional wildlife painting and contemporary art made with taxidermy. Through this contrast, new meaning is created. Contemporary artists challenge hierarchies that place humans at the center of the natural world. Artist Vim Delvoy's work is a radical subversion of the Natural History Museum style taxidermy with which we're all acquainted. Live pigs are tattooed and they become artworks and therefore valuable. They're also safe from slaughter and the meat industry. This work is in stark contrast with wildlife paintings made by classically trained artists who spend their time in the field. They love animals, understand their habits, and see hunting not as a conquest of nature, but as a participation in it. In contrast, artist Yinka Shonabare's intentions are political. This urban fox is armed with a gold-plated gun and a blackberry, the batik fabric of his clothes and dark skin signifying African heritage. The artist references the blackberry riots of 2011, when ethnic minorities in London use social media to stage a protest that turned violent. The objective of Robert Kuhn's 1986 message on the wind is to capture the majesty and fearsome power of the polar bear. In essence, Kuhn's, tax, Kuhn's painting is the two-dimensional equivalent of Natural History Museum taxidermy. The artist duo Snayborn's daughter and Wilson's photography has an activist agenda. They researched all the taxidermy polar bears in the UK, photographed the animals in situ, and included provenances for each bear, gender and age, where it lived, how it died. In doing so, they're reinvesting the animals with agency. Carl Rungius specialized in capturing what might appear to be a chance encounter with wild animals. It's an idealized view of nature that suggests man and beast living together in harmony. In contrast, Amy Stein's chance encounters explore the barriers that we construct to separate domestic space from the wild. Artist Carly Fernandez merges with a bear to create staged scenarios that read like a snippet from a Brothers Grimm fairy tale. Man is redefined as one among the continuum of animals, which includes the human animal. The colonial past is present in many historic wildlife paintings. German artist Wilhelm Kuhnert traveled to East Africa in the late 19th century to study animals in their habitat. He went on safaris, made sketches and field notes, and used these as the basis for his paintings. Andrew Zuckerman's representation features a live animal photographed against a white background. 
the lion meets the viewer's gaze head on as an equal, suggesting a posthumanist perspective. The Amsterdam based duo Idiots reference the transformative power of both money and the ancient power of nature with this sculpture. The lion becomes the conveyor of the artist's meaning while still retaining its inherent symbolism and associations. Robert Kuhn's rear guard portrays an elephant aggressively facing the viewer as his herd retreats. Most remarkable is the reference to military tactics in the title. French artist Daniel Fierman's work is a playful reversal of the laws of physics. His elephant appears weightless, levitating itself, a surreal circus performer. Unlike European traditions of sporting art, closely associated with class hierarchies, in the US, both hunting and wildlife art are connected to populism and freedom from constraint. Contemporary artists often have a less direct connection to nature and wildlife, but they share an equivalent love and respect for animals. Their goal is to probe the deeper meaning of human-animal relations. Some representations of animals focus on kinship and group dynamics, a romanticized, natural way of living in the world that we've left behind. Alaska native artist Nicholas Galanin questions his own culture's ability to progress or move forward in a colonial vacuum. The flattened wolf represents the place from which we're most comfortable viewing indigenous culture. Artist Carly Fernandez dedicated this sculpture to her newborn son and it represents the cycle of birth and death. Both traditional wildlife painters and contemporary artists project human values onto the animals they represent. In this painting of stags fighting by moonlight, the does watch the battle from a safe distance. Despite contrasting representational strategies, the artists in Late Harvest share a common focus on animal others whether harnessing their power as agents of nature or symbols of culture. 12th century poet Alain de Lille's words provide a perfect summation. Every creature in the world is like a book and a picture to us and a mirror. If you find the ideas in this exhibition intriguing at all, you might check out the Nevada Museum of Art's upcoming Art and Environment Conference in October of this year where the Late Harvest exhibition will be the centerpiece. Thank you. Hi, I just wondered if you had, or if the exhibition was considered kind of mythology with, you know, the human figure part animal um, at all. And, the, you know, just kind of thinking about when you were speaking about the relationship between kind of human as an animal as well, if the kind of mythologies of, of different human animal kind of hybrids had become a part of the exhibition at all. I feel like that's been done before. Um, there are a number of exhibitions that sort of consider the, the monster. Um, and I wanted to do something that really diverged from that. And so I think using the actual animal skin somehow lends this sort of frisson, this sort of electric energy because it's the real thing. But I thought about it, of course. <laughs> Hi, I was just wondering um, what kind of conversations you might have been having at the museum in terms of 
perhaps preventing or anticipating any backlash, say, from animal rights activists who might object to the use of the actual taxidermy animals? I feel like we're providing a forum for people to have those conversations. Um, in Nevada, as in many of the states in the West, hunting is a part of some people's lives. Um, and as a sort of new, I moved to Nevada two years ago and it just struck me being a Californian and seeing how differently people consider their relationship with animals. Um, so I really do want to encourage those conversations because I think that um, there's really a groundswell of thinking about our relationships with animals happening, whether it's considering our food ways or you know, our relationships with um, animals, in, even in a zoo and things like that. I think we're, there's a slow changing of consciousness and I want this exhibition to be a part of that. So um, are you combining uh, pieces from your permanent collection, the early landscape paintings, with these contemporary artworks? No, thank you for asking about uh -huh. that. That's one, that's one line I accidentally left out. I'm actually partnering uh, with Adam Duncan Harris, my colleague at the National Museum of Wildlife Art in Wyoming. And actually, um, wildlife art was something that I didn't really know about. And so he uh, made the curatorial selection from his own collection and I wanted to have 25 very iconic paintings. Um, one thing that I think is remarkable is that some of these paintings were executed 20 years ago or even less but they look historical. I proposed that show to them 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the same show. Yeah. I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> Maybe it took 15 years for it to happen, but, but it's actually not taking place at the National Museum of Wildlife Art. I think all their members would probably cancel their membership. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you look in your program, it's now lunch, um, which will take place in the Great Hall Rivera Court. And we return here at 1 p.m. for our keynote address. <laughs>